All right. Hello, hello again, everybody. This is the Back to the Cell study course, week 20 something, 75, 6, 7, 8, something like that. Um, we're meeting together uh, again to uh, go through, continue to walk through the Getty. We're looking at the Getty because the, the Getty is Emma's principal um, source when we're teaching our recruit curriculum. Though, of course, it's informed by the other manuscripts that, that um, Fiori is attributed to. Um, but uh, what we're doing in this Back to the South study course is we are trying to take a pause and look at things that we might not see if we were just showing up to class every week and training and not really reading the manuscript. Because there is a lot of distance between the manuscript and what ends up being taught on the South floor. Because um, the manuscript is quite complex and there's a lot there's a lot to it. Um, so yeah, so we're taking a stroll through the Getty. We're almost finished. We might even get finished today. Depends on how much progress we make. Um, and um, yeah, and it's been awesome. Uh, I can't believe we're almost at the end already. Uh, when we finish this, we're going to start Vadi. We're going to read through Vadi together, and that's going to be cool and fun and interesting. Um, but like I said in my Facebook message today, uh, when we do read Vadi, we're um, we're not going to read Vadi as a unique source. We're going to read it in commentary on Fiore. So, you know, when, when you're doing comparative work uh, in, in scholarly study, there's lots of different ways you can read two people. You can read one is commenting on the other or vice versa. You can read both sources commenting on a topic. Um, or you can read a topic and see it or elements of it in both sources um, you can contrast the two sources as to where they agree and you can contrast two sources to where they disagree and also of course read one source as unique or read both sources as unique in their own context so with fiore um, that's what we've been doing this whole time we've been reading fiore in the context of fiore we haven't been really appealing to anybody um, oh hello baby um, we haven't been really appealing to anybody to explain Fiore. We've been letting Fiore explain himself in his own words. When we read Vadi, we're not going to be doing that. We're going to be reading Vadi uh, as if he was commenting on Fiore. Um, so um, that'll be great. And it'll be for, for our benefit as Fiore students. Um, but anyway, more on that later. So today, again, we're on the mounted section. Um, we started off the mounted section last week. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, about the mounted section or comments from before? I, uh, yes, I did have a comment mm -hmm. about the scholar, the first scholar. Uh, the first scholar who is drawing his single sword, his, uh, the sword in one hand. Uh, this guy here? The, the oh, no. This guy. Um, no, the, yeah. the, the master or the scholar? This guy. Or the, the, master, the master here? Okay. The master. Okay. The, the master. Yeah. The sword in one hand. Uh, that he is, uh, the skill that he is going to employ, we have seen before, in the uh, first master of the sword in one hand. Hmm. Because the first master of the sword in one hand, one of the people he deals with is somebody who's throwing their sword. And this is not going to be a light here. Catch oh, you mean this guy. Sorry, it's it's this be, guy. Uh, I mean this guy this here. This one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Sorry, or go not, on. Not mm -hmm. this one. Oh. Not this one. No, not this the, one? The, the, the master before. Okay. Oh, I don't oh. think we've seen this one yet. Okay. This master here. Stop. Okay. Oh, mm -hmm. That one. That mm -hmm. one right there. Mm -hmm. uh, he's going to be batting aside uh, the spear, the, the lance coming at him. So the first comment I would make is his horse is walking. So he's not moving. And the other horse is charging mm -hmm. at full tilt, to coin a phrase. Mm -hmm. And therefore the the relative speed of the object coming towards him he will have learned how to deal with that judging that exactly because the first limit uh, the first remedy master of the sword in one hand where he's standing with his sword in toda uh, mm -hmm. tail mm -hmm. he says you come at me and he's got three zugadors and one of them is throwing a sword 
Right. And the skill required to time and bat aside a sword being thrown against you hmm. will be the same speed, uh, ability to judge speed coming in as this, uh, as him on charging on horseback. Yeah, I agree completely. Yeah, um, it, it's a it's a good and important thing for us to remember that the masters repeat themselves, the the skills repeat themselves, and uh, though this book, um, though this book can often be described as a collection of moves, it, it's not obvious that there's a teaching pedagogy involved in its um, in in its its layout. It is the case that, nevertheless, the book compounds in our, on itself constantly. So saying that, you know, this master here and the master that we're going to see more of, or another master we're going to see more of, uses the same skills as the master or with the sword in one hand on foot, I think is exactly right, as far as the, the sword goes, yeah. yeah That's a, it's, uh, it's important to understand that the horse with three feet on the ground and one raised is effectively not moving. Whereas the other mm. horse, are, the convention is that horse is charging mm. as fast as possible. Right, with the two. So hoops. he's receiving. Yeah. Yeah. The, the... yeah. Okay, awesome, Bruce. Thank you very much. Anybody else? No? Um, okay. So, um, what did we finish off last week? I think I recall somewhere around here. Did we get to this guy? Where the spear's held under the armpit? Uh, we touched on that, yes. We did, okay. We're at 43V. And the next one. 43, oh, 43V. Oh, perfect. Okay, yeah. we're all the way down here. Perfect. Okay, um, great. Um, so, and just to make one last comment on what Bruce said earlier. So... It's not, uh, this is kind of going back to our discussion of posta, right? It's not obvious to me that there's a big difference between posta um, uh, didona, a breve, boar's tooth, and left tail. The hand, you know, is hovering around the hip to the shoulder with all of those posta, right? And the only difference really is the orientation of the hand. Okay. And, uh, one the poster that really brought this home to me is um, uh, underarm with the sword and buckler with that with the uh, the I thirty three. And I as I, I say this, having just said that, we are not appealing to other sources, but I just want to use it as a visual a visual example. Um, uh, so there's a there's a poster in um, the uh, MS uh, one thirty three. Oh, not this guy. Where is he? Uh, where is he? Where's Underarm? Oh, here we go. Here we go. There's Underarm. Yeah, this guy. So, uh, this guy here. It's a poster called Underarm. Did you know that you can throw a Fendente from here? In fact, this is something that I love to do. <laughs> when, I'm, uh, when I'm in Underarm, if fighting Sword and Buckler, if you just raise this elbow a bit if you raise it if you kind of lift it up you can clear you can clear the way for the sword to come straight out uh well not straight out but to, to come out enough that you can throw a perfectly decent vendente as if the sword was on your shoulder which is a bit of a magic trick if you're not paying attention um and obviously underarm can throw a sotani uh as well um but my point is if the sword is can do this when it's under your arm, then how much more can it do it when it's not under your arm? And and just so, if the sword is just kind of floating on your hip, bringing the sword up to your shoulder is super fast, right? Super fast. Um, and so tail becomes LaDonna in an instant, right? Boar's tooth becomes LaDonna in an instant. LaDonna becomes Boar's tooth in an instant. You know, so this transition on the same side, super subtle, super quick, and uh, really just change your options as to what you what you have. So all that is to say is that um, it's interesting that, uh, and again, I'm going to call back to Bruce's observation 
uh, we see we're get, we're going to continue to see in the sword and armor section a variety of posts on the left side. Some Ladonna, like what Bruce just pointed out, right? So here's more to of a traditional a Ladonna. Um, but here's Boar's Tooth, right? And here's Tail. We're going to see in a second um, of the, of the long tail. I'm not really sure what the big difference is, other than obvious, right? But my point is, there's the difference is not as big as one might think, right? This is another reason why I'm against more and more these days. I'm against, uh, you know, viewing the post as super, super rigid and special, right? I think there's they they blend together very, very intimately. Um, but anyway, um, that's uh, I was that's a great little digression, uh, Bruce. And uh, th thank you for that. Um, so we're starting at 43V. Thank you very much, BD. So let's get right into it. Let's try and finish this off. Um, so we're going to read both uh, together because they're both the same uh, posta. So who's our first uh, victim volunteer? Alex, would you like to read the text for us? The position of the sword is called Kodalunga. It is very good against the lance and any other handheld weapon. As you ride to the right side of the opponent, bear in mind that thrusts and reverse he must be beaten to the outside, that is, sideways, and not upward. Pendenti should similarly be beaten to the outside, lifting slightly the opponent's weapon. From this guard you can perform the plays illustrated. The same guard of Kodalunga is good when the opponent comes with his sword on the reverso side, as does this one. Bear in mind that this guard counters all the blows, both on the Medrito and the Reverso side, and the usable against right and left-handed opponents. We will now see the plays of Quidlunga, from which you always parry, as I have described in the first illustration of the guard. Thank you very much, Alex. Okay. So, um, as Fury said, what we're about to see is we're about to see um, plays of the sword in one hand. That are scholars of this master in Kudalunga, and so just to just to reprise what we did last week, we, the mounted section starts off with lance on lance, okay, and then it's so, uh, sword on lance, and this is a, an, an anomaly here, sword on lance, and then it's sword on sword, and we're going to do a, a bunch of plays there. Uh, coming up, and then we're going to get uh, wrestling, and that's going to that's going to finish the more or less finish the section, except for these two unique plays here. Okay, so that's what's in store for us. Um, so Akutalunga Fiori is pretty explicit about this one. He thinks it's great. Um, it's good when the opponent comes with the sword on the reversal side, as does this one. Um, but this guard counters all blows on Madrid or reverso regardless of the handedness of the opponent. Um, and uh, yeah, so so that's that's pretty explicit. Um, he's not really suggesting any other guard, though keep in mind, of course, he has shown LaDonna and Bor Bors Tooth on the left side, but as I just said, uh, it's not obvious at least that there's a big difference anyway. So these comments you could read as uh, also applying to those previous guards. This here is interesting. Um, when he says, bear in mind that thrust and reverse, he must be beaten to the outside, that is sideways and not and not upward. Re uh, Fidente should be similarly, similarly be beaten to the outside, lifting slightly the opponent's weapon. So um, this is an interesting little tidbit. Uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly um, why he's giving this suggestion, but my speculation is is that beating the sword to the outside brings it more out of play in the passing. So there is there is uh, a risk in fencing when you deflect an opponent's sword, the opponent has good control over it, that they can bring it right back down. And especially if the deflection is, uh, is, is faulty, if it's poor, um, plus the opponent is anticipating it and they got good good blade control um it's perfectly possible to have deflections just pop uh you know a pop out and come right back in fact there's a couple of good uh, Dolagoki plays as well that 
play on that on that uh, precise kind of trick or skill. Um, so uh, beating it to the outside makes that much less likely and it increases the chance that uh, you'll pass each other um, without uh, giving that opportunity. So, Aaron, mm -hmm. uh, I would like to observe that these horses are all drawn walking which means they are not charging at each other at great speeds. So mm -hmm. this would be a play one would use in a melee uh, when you are not traveling at high speed against the other one. So he's not going to pass by, he's going to make a shot. If you beat to the side, then as his cut comes down, it's not going to end up on your horse. If you try and beat it anywhere else, there's a possibility it could end up on the neck of your horse. That's also a good point, Bruce. Horse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Though you know, so again, this... uh, on the first point, it's not it's not obvious as to what you know the tactically the horses are doing. Although I take your point that you know they're not at an obvious they're not going to obviously whiz by each other like before. Fair enough. Uh, and and yeah, that's a great observation that beating it to the side and keeps it well clear of your horse so that's that's that seems important <laughs> it's interesting yeah. that the morgan translation according to aldo the morgan translation of that exact passage is he says and i beat it on and i beat it high and not outside um although uh, although found uh, between the getty and the uh the morgan those very very minor difference in the uh, description um, to my mind, beating the thing high, being straight up, as you go by, allows you to do a number of different things because his arm will not be in your way. Uh, when you beat it to the side, his right arm will be in the center. So if you're trying to, say, wrestle with him or something like that, mm. it's going to be a nuisance. When you beat it high... Uh, and then continue on because these these animals are passing each other. You have greater opportunity for these follow-on plays. It's 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 really uh, to to put it mildly ant fucking. Hmm. But having done these plays a lot, just to figure out which one of those two um, you know translations seems to be more logical, it may just be a textual error by the by the uh, the scribe. Um, mm -hmm. but it, it was one of those things that uh, Aldo pointed out back in like 2008 when he translated, he says, oh, this is interesting that, you know, slight difference in text, whereas the Getty and Morgan text is almost always exactly the same. True, true. Uh, true. so, yeah, so it's, it's one of the, one of those things that, that's, you know, worthy of note. Yeah. And it just shows you how important it is to, uh, to do the comparison, right? Otherwise you'd never notice. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a like really a, small thing, but you yeah. know, it's one of those one of those things you say, yeah, they weren't written by the same people. Yeah. Um, but uh like I said last week, uh the mounted section for us, uh non equestrians is a combination of the the unfamiliar and the familiar. Um, you know, again we're we're approaching this broadly speaking without um, much grasp of the equestrian skills that are gonna be required for this, but uh, we are uh, rather familiar with the uh, a lot of the other things going on, and like we talked about and initially, Bruce's observation about Kotalunga I think is exactly right, and that comes from our understanding of the previous masters on foot. So um, we we know where we are is my is my point. Uh, and let's move on to the plays. All right, Folio forty four R A in the Getty. Uh, Andrew, would you like to give us a read? Okay, this is the first play out of Coda Lunga. The master parries the opponent's sword and and places his... Oh, wait, I'm going to do the second edition. No this is the first play deriving from the guard of Coda Lunga, which we just saw. The master parries the opponent's sword and places his point in the opponent's chest or face as illustrated here. Thank you very much, sir. All right. So, um, here we go. The first most obvious play um, I, I suppose um, from the Kota Longa Master uh, it's uh, it seems as if it's a straight 
thrust to the face after an, an engagement. So it's not uh, it's not clear exactly what the engagement is. Could be a it's probably a cut. Uh, but regardless, whether it's a cut or a thrust, we already know that we can respond uh, in a, such a way that puts our point online. And if the horses are passing, even at a slow pace, it'll be fast enough to affect uh, uh, something close to a single time uh, a remedy. So here in this one play, we're seeing an example of what appears to be uh, or is likely something of a exchange of point or a single t or or something like um, what we're again. Uh, I should bring this guy up so we have it on hand. What we're again used to from the master of the sword in, in one hand, where we already know from the master that we have a, s a single time uh, parry thrust in prime <laughs> against Vendentes and Mendritos and whatever. Uh, even though we're making the defense with the true edge as a cut, we're still ending up with a thrust. So this could well, very well be what we're looking at here. Making, as well. a, a, making a true edge cover against a reversi, which would be with the false edge, would give you this exact picture. And the um, on foot, the far right play that you showed is basically show, giving that up. Uh, where am I? Uh, here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one, the far right. This, uh, this guy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. this guy, second scholar. Mm -hmm. it, basically ending up that way but because they don't have the uh, speed passing each other, right? And so there's a lot more open space between them. Mm -hmm. But as that space collapses, if, if this were, again, a reversi, you'd end up with, instead of a cut, you can get your point online much more easily. And, and I dare say that the, the scholars... Mm -hmm. uh, arm is probably relatively collapsed or at least bent over his elbow is bent i doubt that he's got it tucked up under his arm no no you know oh is that like, a oh i see elbow. how some yeah. could say that yeah. Yeah. he hasn't got his elbow against no his no no thing. yeah the, unlikely the, the zook here is catching the bad end of it there's no two ways about it yep i would think hitting the chest would be pretty pretty difficult Whereas mm -hmm. hitting the face would be pretty easy but mm -hmm. you know it's one of those things where if you parried a bit wide you could still bring your point down and into his chest or face either mm -hmm. way. But, uh, you know, there's nothing good for the zoo here. Nope. It's going to be a bad morning. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we can also speculate here. Well, we're going to look at, we'll look at cuts next. So I won't even talk about that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Any questions about that one? <laughs> nope. Awesome. Moving on. Oh, is this guy over here? Getting lost in the tabs. All right, 44RB. Um, BD. This is the second play in which, from a similar beating aside of the opponent's sword, I strike the opponent over the head, since I observed that he is not wearing head armor. All right, here we go. Uh, what's the what's the horror movie where the the girl's head turns all the way around? Is that the the, the Exorcist or the, the Shining? Exorcist. So this is the horse version of the Exorcist. If you <laughs> if you look closely, the the horse's head is like at a, a total forty five degree angle or whatever. Yeah, he's trying to, he's yeah, trying to bite the other horse, nipping his bum or oh, they whatever. Do that. Yeah. <laughs> No, the stallions do that to each other. They'll bite in. In fact, he, if that horse could have gotten at the at scholar's leg, he probably would have. Mm. It's it just it's oh, a really they're, interesting. They're nasty, you know, they could have drawn. Yeah, it, it, they could have drawn these horses very, you know, uh, formulaic, right? And no, they didn't. A, All these horses have character, which is which is a curious little element of. The, I'm I'm sure that Bruce picture. will agree with me that yeah. horses like to bite each other. Yeah, and horses' heads can turn that far around and that far over to the side mm. very easily. Yeah, it's it's very no. cool that they they, they put they're it not in quite here. like a snake, but they're they're mm. they're pretty flexible and they'll do that stuff. Get a chomp in if they can. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, in keeping with the Kotalunga master, we have this second scholar. The first one dealt with what seemed like a thrust after a parry, and this one is a cut. 
So now we've got all our bases covered. Fiori notes in the text that he observed his enemy not having head protection. And so he, you know, with the implication, I suppose that a cut is going to be useful. Right. Um, but, uh, but there we go. We've covered all the bases um, with basic sword cuts in those two plays. Um, and now, obviously, because Fiori said that Kotalunga can deal with all cuts from all posta, regardless of the handedness of the opponent uh, or, or the side, then that's something that you'd want to extensively train because, of course, not all of those cuts and sides and handednesses are equal, right? Some of, some of the matchings are going to be strange, as we know from our round-the-clock drills. Some of it doesn't happen the way you expect and you have to do some things to compensate for some strange angles and things like that. So all of that is, I imagine, something worth drilling extensively on horseback. Um, but we're going to have to take his word for it. I don't know. For, for me, I see this as um, it's going to be a false edge cover, whether it's from Drito or Reversi, because you want to get behind the guy's sword. If you do a true edge on true edge, You'll never get behind a sword unless you turn your pommel over, and that's another set of plays. This one here, you sweep up from uh, you sweep up from Cotalunga with your false edge. Sure. You're going to clear the line. Period. It's going to clear like 270 degrees of, of attack. Mm -hmm. Oh, and uh, uh, I tell you made this point last Wednesday. Um, as a reminder, these images are not. Um, they're not uh, snapshots from a camera, right? Not um, points of time. They tell a story. Yeah, and uh, nor ought we necessarily read them as meaning explicitly everything they show. And what I mean by that is here, the image seems to show the sword of the opponent who's being struck. Kind of maybe it even skipped off the cross guard or at least it's impacted on the strong you know, what does it mean? What is it doing? Blah, 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 blah. Forget you the existential crisis. This is a sword that's been parried, right? That That's how I, I suggest you, you read it. It was parried at the from the first third as is intended, and it's in motion, and it's not coming back down. It's being hit away while this guy's attack is coming down. So no need to to worry. All right, moving on up. Oh, I just have a quick question. Yes, sir. You're not even you're not even old enough to know that song. What? <laughs> <laughs> That's from the '70s, man. Hey, yeah, man. My first, uh, I, I, my dad got me started with Stevie Wonder. That's the theme song from the Jeffersons. It is. It is indeed. Mm. History is weird. Okay, anyway, so we're gonna, uh, uh, Graham. <laughs> yeah. Um, just a quick question about the uh, body mechanics of cutting from that side. I guess body mechanics. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, he always shows the false edge cover, and Kel was saying that that would be an awkward hand position to get the cover anyway. But is false edge no, also I didn't. No, 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 no. I didn't no, say it's no, awkward. No, no. I didn't say it was awkward. Or impossible. <laughs> or difficult. Okay. You're, I think you may be confusing the two characters here. The uh, scholars on the left. Did yeah. the garter on his knee. He came up from Cotalonga and he made a false yeah. edge cover before they got to this mm -hmm. position. He's already finished the cover and is hitting the guy. So the story here is I, you know, I beat the thing away and I swat you in the face. Yeah. Sir, I thought you were saying something about if you were coming up with a, um, with the true edge, it would be difficult to get up behind your opponent's sword or something. Yeah. If you come up with the yeah. true edge, you're going to end up on his sword with your cross uh, uh, to the right and your point to the left it's very difficult with the true edge to get to this position uh, behind his sword if you did that then you've got to do a, a mezzo volta of the sword blade to make your cut come down whereas if you've got your false edge presented that is, uh, yeah. you know, it's kind of the same play from, from Metz, uh, Metz support to the hero with sword in two hands, where you beat the thing up and away, and then you come back crashing down with a fendente. It's a, a, just a smaller version of that, but right. because of the uh, inertia of the two horses moving past each other, that guy's face is going to get split. 
Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, so, 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 I, so I usually... Mm -hmm. that if you came up with the true edge, that would, would that not put you in the previous scholar? Harry's with the true edge, and there he is, <laughs> ready to stab? Uh, yeah. It would put you in, in longer and so prime. The true edge... True edge yeah. would put you in longer, ready to, to drive it into his face, and this one is a cut, follows the cut. Yeah, this this one follows the uh, yeah oh yeah path that we saw so many times from um, uh, Middle Iron Gate, where <clears throat> you you come up under um, uh, Dodonna's Fendente and you set it aside. Well, it's the same sort of thing. Whether you mm. you know even if the guy's throwing a, a reversal Fendente, uh, he's trying to get behind your sword so that he can do the same thing to you, right? And then it's a good tactic. There's nothing wrong with a. a uh, fendente reverso falso filo like like using the yeah. false edge and the descending cut is not something we practice a lot but it's talked about a mm. fair bit and once we get into into body as i presume mm. we're running into body at some point you'll see that he you know he says well fendente prefers prefers the true edge he doesn't say it has to have it he says mm. he prefers it fury never is really explicit about fendente he just says mm. you know they come from this side that side whatever but the reversal or the mazani he's very specific about how they work um anyway in in, in this particular case when you you look at the beat here he's gotten behind the Zugadori sword so that he can swat him in the face and he doesn't have to worry about uh, point alignment because he's going to be able to cut him. Yeah. And uh, uh, was it Graham that asked the question? Yes. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, Graham, there, there, there's your answer. There is that he gets behind it, and the way to get behind somebody's sword, whether you're standing still or whether you're moving, is to use your false edge to set it aside, or you've got a longer beat and you have to bring <clears throat> your point back online uh, or your true edge back online. So normally, when you make a beat from your left side you use the false edge false edge rising satano and then mm -hmm. that will set you up for a true edge fendente which is the better fendente the much stronger fendente um, uh, false of philo uh, fen course, fendentes yeah. are not very strong but they are fast really really fast so it's something that can cut the time or you it can help you get into a cover that you would otherwise miss because of the tempo. So it's it's a, a thing that you can play with very easily on the Pell if we ever mm -hmm. get a Pell again. Uh, well, the Pell's there, whether it's somewhere to hang it when, mm -hmm. whenever the cell finally opens. But uh, you can practice this kind of stuff by bringing your Fendente, especially from the left, don't bother from the right, uh, but from the left, bring your Fendente down with the false edge, whether with one hand or two. And uh, you'll see that it's got quite a bit of usefulness. It's shorter, but it's also very, very fast. It's like an extended version of cutting from uh, Bicarno. Yeah, and the last thing I'd say, Graham, is that um, conventionally, we usually deploy uh, as a parry the edge that's forward from the post that we've chosen to lie in. So in the case of Kotalunga, the 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 edge that we're setting up to deploy in Kotalunga is the true. But if we desire to to deploy the false, and we could all we can always decide to do either, usually that precipitates a post to change. So in this case, um, what I have number one here, if the scholar wanted to throw the false he would probably just turn his hand over into Boar's Tooth and then lift it right up, right? That's the most expedient yeah, right. direction of doing yeah. it. If he didn't, if he wanted to stay with the true, then he would uh, just deploy. Uh, he'd deploy the true edge uh, here. I know that's a shitty drawing, but you have to deal with it. Okay. <laughs> but does that, does that make sense? Some of the extra, the yeah. extra yeah. blue yeah. stuff is kind of really confusing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does. Wh know. Which extra blue stuff? <laughs> All right. Um, awesome. Yeah, and but and and uh, all those cutting mechanics and things and those questions apply on foot, right? So it's important that we. I'm saying this more to the viewers on YouTube, such as they are. Uh, <laughs> we. It's important to to underline that you know this isn't. That we're talking about mounted combat, but we're not, right? Just like with all Fiori, we're we're talking about fighting all the time. Anyway, um, let's move on. <clears throat> Thank you. 
You are welcome, sir. All right. The next play, 44RC. Uh, Bruce. Here is another play, the third, in which, after beating away the opponent's sword, I grasp it with the left hand and strike him in the head in this manner. I can also strike with my point. Thank you, Bruce. All right, here we go. A good old inside uh, grab uh, with a uh, with a with a follow-on. So just like with all of our previous checks and grabs that we've known before, we would follow the same protocol, right? So we're, the sword is not going to come off until uh, the the check is made, right? Until the hand is has traded the contact. And also, the hand is not going to go to get contact unless the sword is relatively still. So the hand isn't going to try and pluck the sword out from from uh, the, the air when it's flying. Um, you're not going to go for these sorts of things conventionally after you've made a beat, right? Some large beat. You're going to do it when, um, typically, when the swords come to some kind of bind. Right. And we've talked before about how the problem with binding, especially with the sword in one hand, the problem with binding when their sword is in your presence is they're risking you grabbing it in a, in a, in a snake like snake strike like quickness. Right. And as soon as that sword is grabbed, they're they're super fucked. And this is a perfect example. If these guys were on foot, it would work just just the same and it'd be just as good. So as long as the geometry is set up for you and the tempo is right, you got it. There's not much more to it as far as I can see. Any uh, Anybody else have anything here? Is there a loss of control of the horse and taking your left hand off the reins? Off the reins? Yeah, that's that's a good observation. Seems like it's... Uh, no. Uh, no. The horse and rider are good... Uh, if the horse and rider are good, the rider does not need the reins to control the horse. Also, they're not at a canter. So, I do not need my reins to tell my horse to turn left, right, to go forward, or even to stall. Because my I'm a rider, and I've been doing this for a while. Anybody, it, it, These people would all have been riding since they could walk, and the horse, well-trained horse will listen to the rider's legs and seat and whole lower body more so than to the uh, the reins. The reins are there for communication but not for guiding the horse. So yes, you can drop the reins and, and hit and your horse isn't going to go anywhere. Well, oh, so BD, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're observing that uh, despite the fact that the reins are obviously important in some way, uh, in this particular play, the scholars made made the choice to drop the reins and go for the check. Yes, that's correct. So clearly it was worth it. Uh, and he's not losing too much by dropping yeah. the reins. Yeah. Um, I guess further to what Bruce said, uh, riding a horse, especially a well-trained horse that you're uh, accustomed to riding, uh, trained in a way that you're accustomed to, is not like driving a car. You don't need a steering wheel. You can do almost everything with the foot pedals. It's a little more like flying a plane where you've got a stick for, to control your airlines, but all of the turning and whatnot is done with your feet, which controls the rudder. Um, there's a lot of other controls in an aircraft to accelerate and stuff, and you just use your spurs and whatnot to accelerate a horse. But to check the horse to get it to stop, or if it doesn't want to turn, to get it to turn, um, that's where you need to use the reins. And in this particular case, that's not an important thing compared to controlling the play between the swords. Mm -hmm. Does that make it a little clearer? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, that sounds to me. All right, moving right along. Next, we have a pommel play. Which is really fantastic. 44 RD. And Connor, would you like to read this one? 
Yes, thank you. This is the fourth play. The student is about to strike the opponent in the head and disarm him as shown. Thank you for your verbosity, Fury. In my brevity. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, he's going to go on and on about uh, about how much you'll regret the play, and then sometimes he doesn't say anything. Um, yeah, so so we got this one. Um, coming over top, so this is the scholar on the right, coming over top of the enemy's hand and um, p pinching it, sweeping it down uh, while the strike comes down. So the, the, the key thing that's obviously hard to explain is that if done well, the, the enemy sword here does not have free range of motion. It's not free to come down uh, like yours is. So the, they look relatively equal in position by the drawing, but this isn't a case of risking a double hit for those of you who may be worried. The sword, the arm that's underneath is being pinched and controlled. The one that's on top is has the free rein yeah. to move. Um, if, if perchance the combined swords or the wrist control is coming towards the uh, scholar's face, he can easily lift his hand from the uh, bridle uh, or for, from the reins mm. to uh, grab the, the mm. furniture of the oncoming sword. The, uh, the Zug is really messed up here. The mm. pinched wrist, as he's going by, he's going to put a lot of pressure on his elbow and shoulder because the weight of the horse is carrying them is much much stronger than a human body joint um, it, it, this is a, a very enviable position to get into for the scholar he is going to mess the guy up simply by riding past him slowly he doesn't even have to accelerate and he's going to be able to put enormous pressure on that wrist both the radius and the ulna because he's putting the grip of his sword against the flat of the outside of the wrist and if you've ever knocked your your uh, the back of your wrist against a door or a door jam or a pipe or something like that, you know that it's not a good thing. It really hurts. So basically, you've got this effect going on. The control of the sword is completely lost. Uh, the Zugador is in a bad spot here in terms of retaining his sword. He might be able to retain his seat on the horse, but if the... Uh, the scholar comes out of this and swats him in the face with the pommel as he goes by. There's just so many ways to hit him from, you know, different angles and whatnot. Yeah. The, the, the Zug has no option. He, he wouldn't even be able to duck it because his arm's strung out. Yeah, it's a great, a great play. Someone observed in the scholar class uh, last week that uh, this is a, this is a play that's. Um, visible in a number of Messer uh, uh, manuals, which is true. Um, pommel hooks from underneath, we're already familiar with from previous plays in the book. Um, pommel hooks from over are just in the similar theme. So, very cool. And we might even get to see a pommel uh, hook from under if we continue. <laughs> Any further questions about this one? I, I uh, passed. <laughs> Yeah, to a middle key sort of scenario. Is it, uh, is it possible? I'm sorry. Uh, pardon me. I'm sorry. You're, you're breaking up there. Can you repeat that, please? Uh, yes. As the horses ride past, would this put the Zugador into a, a middle key type position where their elbow and shoulder would get wrenched as well? Uh, no, this is more of an arm bar. Okay. He keeps the arm straight and pinches the wrist towards like he's, he's pinching the wrist um, with kind of a forward action of the thumb. I should say the scholar is. Mm -hmm. So that the pommel's pinching hard against the bones of the wrist. Uh, he's not going to go for a joint lock because they're too far away. Mm -hmm. if, he's, if, if, if he needs to get into position to do a middle key, he's going to have to be really, really close. And middle key on the same arm is almost impossible to get. Yeah, he'd likely... Using the lever of the sword... He'd likely need to be underneath the pommel. Yeah. Uh, to, this, to, to lift the arm up to get the middle key opportunity. This play is uh, here. I'm going to cause you a lot of pain, and now I'm going to cause you more pain while you spit out chiclets. There's there's a lot of pain compliance in this play. 
Ja. It's a good one. Did someone uh, else have a question? Yeah, I just had a little... I heard two voices. Mm -hmm. um, so this is after the cover's made, correct? Oh, yeah, not... definitely. Yeah, definitely. yeah, yeah. He's not, he's not sneaking in from left no. tail. No, 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 no. Up no, and no. around and catching. Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> or no, this is after the cover. When when um when the Zugs the Zugadores arm ends up on the inside of the scholar's wrist, this is a really easy pinch to do. Right. Um, if we were on foot, you'd use your left hand to slap it away instead of grabbing it. But slapping slapping it away while your arm's in the way is is even worse. So for the scholar, pinching his arm gives him a control until they get very close. And that pinch is going to make uh, the Zeus arm and sword go down between the two horses. So when the scholar hauls off and drifts him with the pommel, which would be sort of a, a left to right stroke, if it were horizontal or a left to right descending stroke across the face, um, Depending on how the, the ten, how the sword gets free, uh, either way that the scholar's going to have incidental contact with the sleeve of his uh, arming jacket, and he's going to literally smash teeth or break uh, the eye socket of the, the zugadori with the pommel of the sword as the two of them go by. Uh, it's not the strength of his arm; his arm is a guidance system. It's the uh, inertia of the two horses passing each other. They'll create that horrific uh, blow, and and I'm telling you, it's like a mace shot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and uh, if we think about it, uh, Graham, the entry the entry here um, mm -hmm. is so this the scholar. I'm going to level one and two, uh, with the scholar being number one. So, um, oh no, that's I wanted to reverse it. Uh, so depending on the engagement the swords will be or the scholar's hand will be uh in different will have different opportunities so if they engage um if they engage with uh mendritos so they're both coming from the right side right this one's coming from the right side this one's coming from the right side then the hand of the zugadori right it's going to be across his own body mm -hmm. and the scholar's hand is going to be on the on on this side so this is like pommel strike material right this is this is similar to the kind of engagement you get um in the uh strato section right right yeah when um come on low anyways you get what i'm talking yeah. about right whereas if the engagement is is reversey then this the scholar's hand is already on the inside and all they have to do is kind of lift up their lift up their hand inside and drop the pommel down. So all that is to say is that it's likely that this will come most naturally from uh, an engagement where they're engaged uh, reversey on reversey. Because that way the scholar, is, is, his hand is inside rather than outside. Yeah, and that's that's a much more common thing because mm -hmm. they're riding past each other on the right. Yeah. So a reversey blow is the most sensible blow mm -hmm. in that situation. Yeah, it covers. You know, yeah, right. exactly. Yeah, geometrically. Yeah, and it puts your sword in the way to defend as well, right? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that helps a lot. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. This one, getting into some fun ones now. Forty-four VA. Uh, Cal, would you like to read this one for us? Sure. Thank you. <clears throat> this is the fifth play involving a parry that beats the opponent's sword away. I throw my arm around his neck as I turn with my whole blade and throw him to the ground for sure. My counter is the second play that comes after this one. Be sure, however, not to do this in armor. Thank you very much, Kel. Um, all right, 44 VA. Uh, well, that looks familiar. <laughs> I can go back to the text real quick. Oh, uh, yep. And as I turn... As I turn with the sword, I don't, I don't quite get that line. Uh, so this um, is the thing. As I, I throw my arm around his neck, as I turn with my whole blade. Read the second one. It makes more sense. And I throw him to the ground for sure. 
what does your blade have to do? Like, I guess keep keep on going with the trajectory of your sword, or you like, ba basically you make you you know you make sort of a a loop, <clears throat> almost as if you were trying to do a figure eight moulinette. You make a loop, so you've made your cover from the reverse side, and you're behind his sword, but you're too close to do this wrist grab that we just saw, right? Okay, so you, like the swords aren't in, in the middle. So you're too close for that. So in, you're behind his sword. He can't hit you. He can, at, at worst can hit your horse in the bum. Uh, yeah. But you turn your sword right around because before your elbow was down and your hand was up. You need your elbow up at the level of your hand to make this work. Um, in the dagger plays... Uh, I don't know whether it's the fifth or sixth scholar mm -hmm. of uh, the first remedy. Sixth, master. I think, is the sixth. Six, is it? Yeah. Uh, so. Anyways, we we call we call it the clothesline. Third, I lied uh, to you. you. Third, I was just testing you. The third. third. Okay. Uh, you tested me. Great. Mm -hmm. I, I don't I don't remember stuff that way. I remember at, mm -hmm. by situation. Um, <clears throat> I, my memory house is not dysfunctional. It's the sixth play. Uh, that's why. Anyway, anyway, it was six play. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, so the, this fellow uh, is he's got a wide space on the arms. So in this case, he's made the cover uh, with his left hand, which is the first remedy master, and and then he stepped up and, and hooked this guy up with the crook of his elbow while stepping behind his leg to make a, a really violent high amplitude throw in, in a very similar fashion. If he had a sword in his right hand, he would have to turn his hand over to make this happen. And, and those of you that have done this one in class know that you put the back of your right hand into the small of uh, your Zudori's neck at the back where the nape of the skull comes into the, the spine. You use the back of your hand there because it makes your arm into a tight V. Whereas if you tried to cup it with your palm, your arm would be more of a U shape. You don't get the constriction. With the same technique on the horseback, he just happens to have a sword in his hand, which he has to get out of the way. The sword's in the way, so he has to turn it around. Therefore, a turn of the sword. Okay. If you saw it, if you saw it, it'd be like, oh, okay, yeah, he's just whipping the sword out of the way. He's not trying to hit the guy with the sword. He may have already hit him with the pommel. If you hit him with the pommel and the horses aren't moving past each other too fast, you get to this sort of situation where, <clears throat> I'm not mistaken, is this the one where he says slam your horse's um, shoulder into the other horse's haunches? Or no, that that's a one? couple couple more. Uh, that's a yeah. couple more? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, in this case, horses like to shove each other around. They like to shove people in their stall around, too. Um in this particular case, horses aren't afraid to get close to each other. They constantly jostle and stuff. And and a trained war horse will use its weight like a like an NHL defenseman slamming people around. Um, <clears throat> in this particular case, when you turn your hand over again so that your palm is down, you now have the crook of your elbow to hook the guy's chin up, and it gives you exactly the same sort of high amplitude throw that we got in the first remedy master of dagger in that particular scholar does that make any more sense or is it just too much information um yeah i, I think i got it so basically get your arm in like close on it's, yeah you, you're no longer relying on the sword the sword's done its job it's now something you want to hold on to like you need it for later type of thing but right now you want to hook them up with your elbow so can you and, go back to the text then I'm sorry. Can you, uh, Aaron? Can you go back to the text? Ah. Okay. As so I like, turn, mm -hmm. as I turn with my whole blade. So the turn with my whole blade that does not necessarily imply turn of your body. That is a turn of your arm to get around his neck. That's right. Yeah, that's how I read uh, it okay. too. Mm -hmm. All right. That's a tuta volta of the blade, as we say. <clears throat> when you turn the blade along its axis, that's a. So do you just like let the horses ride, and that'll bring them to the ground naturally, or, or like, like? Oh no, you got You got to pull them up. You got to lean. Yeah. You're gonna have to literally stand on your right foot in the stirrup. You're gonna stand so hard on your right foot, and you're gonna lean a bit off to the left, and that'll drag him out of his saddle, 
Um, the saddles, as you can see, pretty much cup the bum. They're not a high saddle that holds up the back of the spine type of thing. Um, this is not a particularly weak saddle. This is a really good, comfortable saddle uh, to sit in for a long length of time. From what I've been told, because I've never sat one, I've seen uh, them in, in, in several cases, but um, compared to, say, a Western saddle, which allows you to pretty much turn all the way around one way or the other because the the back of the uh, of it is so wide and, and shell like because they need to do that for you know rope and cattle and horses and you know that kind of stuff. This is not what these horses are be, are doing or expected to do. Uh, you know the, the kind of thing that a cowboy and a quarter horse is expected to do is is the sort of thing that. Uh, these people would find great fun and consider it uh, like circus tricks. So basically just uh, do the wrestling. You're yeah. doing a wrestling move. Mm -hmm. the You're doing a wrestling move, exactly. All right. Makes sense. Thank you. And there are more to come. Isn't that right, baby? Yes, there is. Here's mommy. Okay. She just woke up. All righty. Next is, wrestling play. Is Penny, Penny being helpful? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She was just uh, doing that play to me she, she, as I was burping her. <laughs> uh, speaking of uh, pummel hooks from underneath, 44 VB. Uh, Amber, would you like to be this one for us? Here is the sixth play, with which I am about to disarm the opponent. With the hilt of my sword, I lift his hilt on high, which will cause his weapon to fall out of his hands. Thank you very much, Amber. All righty. Um, here we go. A pommel hook from underneath, like we said before. Um, seeing as you're passing on the other side now, BD, I would suggest that the middle key is off the table in this one. Um, but if you were on the same side somehow and you got the pommel hook, then you might be able to, to uh, fin finagle You it. could put the pommel into the elbow and make a middle key out of it for sure. If you were passing on the opposite, on the like, opposite side, right and right, yeah, on right and right, on the left, in this case, he's reaching literally across his body, yeah. to get that hook in. It may be that the Zook has tried the last play, and to get out of it, you counter this way. So instead of letting your it's possible, uh, both of your uh, long bones in your forearm be pinched, you turn it so that the uh, ulna is facing up <clears throat> the bump of your hand that the the, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the the heel of your hand where the pinky is you turn it with your pinky up and that puts the palm behind his and creates the same sort of pressure from below that was pr applied in the previous play it's an interesting thing to comment here that of the sword in armor section if it's not shown in any of the plays but it, mm -hmm. you won't be able to find it there, mm -hmm. don't bother. Mm -hmm. um, if you're working the box, you can use um, Bastard Cross to do this exact same play because you swing your pommel up in under his pommel. Mm -hmm. If you've managed to bash his blade aside or he's missed or, or he's lost his balance or whatever, you can hook, you, you will not be able to find this in the picture. No, no, I know. Uh, go on, go on. Um, okay, but, but you can hook with your pommel and use your box against the outside of his box as it were and you're going to be able to lift his pommel high his point will be way offline in the distance and as you step across or pull back he's going to be very badly off balance so it's a very similar leverage play but and because it's a sword in one hand on horseback uh, there's a lot of pressure on your wrist here. You don't have the stability of, of the leverage of the sword in your in both hands. You're going to have to pull this thing off. And reaching across your body and hooking this up hmm. is, a, for my mind, a feat of horsemanship. Bruce, have you got a comment there? I'm just looking at the sword on the far side of the horse's neck. So... I yeah, I'll don't bet, know. I'll bet get over there, eh? Yeah. Yeah, he's he's taken a swing, and there's been a couple of swings here, and and because to get it over the other side of the horse's neck means that you're reaching way over there, and those horses are right up close to each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Well, to my mind, this is a situation that the scholar didn't plan to go here, but here's here's what you can do when you're in this position. Um, mm -hmm. As I say, it's fairly similar to the play before it, although Fury doesn't consider it a countermaster. Um, I really have no opinion about whether um, the, the Pisani Dossi has a similar play. I don't think it does. I think this is unique to the to the Getty. And turns out it does. Turns out it does. Yeah. Does, eh? Morgan okay. and PD have one. Yeah. Okay. It's a little bit different in the PD, though, if mm. I'm not mistaken. He's not as he's not reaching. And they're not on the same side of the horse. Right. Uh, on the side of the horse. I, I have to look at it again. Sorry. Boom. They're on different sides. That's correct. Yeah. And on the Morgan, they're on different yeah. sides as well. Yeah. Is also very notable. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This is this is one of the things that uh, I think that mm -hmm. uh, Greg Maley and company comment on. Well, here's here's an obviously art art, you know, artistic error because how the hell would you get your arm over there? Well, I don't consider Greg Maley any better a horseman than I am. So, I'm going to say that this is this is my opinion. This is kind of a counter, or if things didn't go just the right way, well, hey, you got something else to work with anyways. So to me, it's it's fairly neutral. Uh, I don't think that the scholar's in a bad position. I don't think the scholar would go, would have gone to this position by choice. I think you would have cut him in the face mm -hmm. if he could have. But, uh, you know, if you find yourself overbound in this particular place, well, you wrench him back, and that's all there is to it. But this involves turning your sword over. Because the other fellow in the play before had his point up as well and that's why he was getting the big crank in this case on the inside of your wrist you're not going to take the same sort of pressure it's yep. not going to hurt as bad yep i could not add anything more uh any other questions about this one is the scholar the one in the back this guy yeah yeah. Oh, okay. That makes more sense. You actually see, you can see the little, uh, see the little tucked yeah, in. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to oh, see yeah. in the black and white. In the Getty, in the Getty, if you see in the high res version of it, you yeah. can see the gold. Yeah. You know, one of the interesting conventions here, and this is a an, an obscure sort of uh, manuscripty subject topic, but uh, in the mounted section, obviously there's horses that are blocking. Uh, legs and things like that and so the artist has to decide where to put the golden garter and on a couple plays uh, and at least one of them the artist has a stroke of genius and he goes oh i'll put the garter on the on an, uh, the arm and you yeah. know and then you see it and you're like oh that's brilliant wait the fuck why didn't they do that with all of them i would have saved them so well, much you, trouble <laughs> you see it you see it in the pisani dossi but, in the armor yeah. section the the, the uh the garters are almost always around the ankle Almost always. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Um, I tend to wear mine just under my knee cop, so mm -hmm. that it's on my uh, my right leg. But uh, same, you same. know, it's not the most convenient place to put the thing. It's true. Um, all right. The next play, which is the counter, forty-four VC. Um, I'll read this one. This is the seventh play, which is the counter to the fifth, and it involves a strike to the leg. Don't use this play against an armored opponent. Okay, so this is an interesting one. Um, the allegation by Fiore, first of all, is that this amounts to a counter. And y you could reasonably s suspect that it does. Um, the counter obviously being there's going to be a false edge leg, what looks like a false edge leg shot to the inside of the opponent's leg who isn't armored here. Now, you might ask, well, how does this resolve what's going on up here? And the simple answer is it doesn't necessarily. It's, it's a pain compliance play, right? There's nothing about getting cut of the leg that's going to change the geometry of this particular throw. But uh, given the circumstances, it is a perfectly reasonable thing to try. Why, why not? Okay. When we discussed this on Wednesday night with the scholars, I made a comment about the amount of pressure that you need to put with your right foot down into the stirrup mm -hmm. to hook somebody up this way. And I said, I wish Bruce were here to make a comment on this. So here's your chance, Bruce. To my mind, 
he's cutting the leg because it's an available target and having a whack in the back of your leg is going to unsettle your footwork because you're standing in the saddle. You're not posting in the saddle like on a modern Western, your legs are bent. These guys are standing in the saddle. So if you have one foot that is uh, not as strongly supported because of the pain element, you won't be able to push off as well with the opposite foot to counterbalance it because sitting a, a saddle without rocking all over the place is something that requires both feet. Do you agree, Bruce? Uh, I would agree, yes. Um, I would observe that the whole grab your opponent by the neck and pull him off his horse is extremely difficult to do because um, reaching over and pulling somebody towards means I'm being pulled towards. The only way I could keep myself in the saddle is with my left leg gripping the horse. And I suspect if you cut my left leg, I would lose my ability to stay in my saddle. Yeah. Because, mm. leave, um, uh, remember, I'm, I'm gripping with both legs. I'm not so much standing in the stirrup. If I lean off to the right-hand side, as the, the, the player was doing, I need to get a good uh, reach around with my left leg to hang on. Uh, think of it if you were mm. going to... Okay, quick, I got a question lead, for you, Bruce. Have you, you have, have you ever ridden with your legs fully extended like this in the stirrups so that you're standing on them, or have you always ridden with bent leg? <coughs> um, I've ridden without stirrups. Okay. Which means my leg is which extended. You have to, which, which means you have to grab it, but that's not how a medieval saddle works. Medieval saddle, right. literally so, used to, you're, you're literally standing in the saddle. I'm, um, yeah, I'm hypothesizing when, here. Yeah, when when you're looking at these saddles, they're always with their feet fully extended, like like shoving against the floorboard of a car in high acceleration. Um, these guys didn't ride with bent legs unless they were out hunting, and even then sometimes they didn't do that. So... That's one of the big things that I've gotten from people like Arnie Keats and Toby Capwell and uh, uh, what's the other guy, Sewell, Dominic Sewell. When their their various comments about uh, how the saddles are designed and built. And there's a really great website called Historic Saddles where I'm, I'm pretty sure it's, it's Arnie Keats, but I'm not 100% sure. But they built historical saddles uh, based on 15th century ones because these guys are all 15th century jousters. And the saddles are really, really different than a modern, uh, uh, you know, Western saddle, for example. The, the Portuguese saddles apparently are fairly close because they tend to ride with their legs straight out as well. But uh, the, what do they call those guys? Gauchos. Um, the, that particular thing of standing in the saddle was something that's been pointed out uh, many times by the jousting community. That it's a really important thing to note compared to Western saddles, where your legs are what holds you in in the uh, you know on the horse. You grip in the horse and also doing a lot more guiding with the horse. Whereas when you look at the construction of the um, what are the things down the side that line the inside of the stirrup against the horse? There's a word for that thing. Um, skirt? No, that's not it. Um, uh, there's like a on on 14th to 15th century uh, saddles. A lot of times you see them built up like they're almost armored around the legs for the tournament, and uh, that particular piece. And plus the barding on the horse will give you some insulation from the ability to grip the horse. You couldn't ride a medieval war horse this way bareback. You just couldn't do it. It wouldn't. You wouldn't stay on as easily as with uh, the, the the way the saddle is arranged. So your point about uh, you know gripping with your legs is is well taken. I I, I get that. But uh, my understanding of standing in the saddle is the same as you can't wrestle without the structure. Your without the fortitudo, um, 
and I don't see how gripping the horse compares to standing on the, uh, you know, the thing that's connected to the horse. So, you know, uh, thanks for your opinion. I, I appreciate it. It's enlightening. Yes, as always. I had a question about this play. Mm -hmm. um, uh -huh. I, I mean, I can see that his head is being turned as he's getting thrown, but how well could he actually see the leg on the other side of the horse? Well, he can see the horse's ass. Yeah, but like right? that. So, the, the so they're, they're like, a, it's a they're blind, like forward to that. It's a blind shot. That's what it kind of looks like. It kind of looks like a blind shot. Well, so. It's, uh, it's but on the other hand, sure. the leg. It's it's false edge. It's a blind shot because he isn't seeing it. But then he doesn't need to. Yeah, that's because right. He I'll... knows that leg is running along the outside yeah. of the horse. What he's going to hit if he whips his sword down there is going to be the leg. Yeah, unless he's fence or unless he's fighting Long John Silver, he should have a reasonable expectation the leg is is in fact there. So, so mm. he doesn't need to see it. Okay. Uh, and he's got and he's got direct contact with the other person's body. Right, in because he's in the process of being thrown, so he knows where the other person's body is. So he should be able to, he should know where the where the leg is. Yeah, chances of him staying in the saddle are not great, but chances of him being thrown are much less. Mm -hmm. Like he may be wobbled badly, but cutting the guy's leg is going to take his ability to yank you clean off the horse away from him. Um, this yeah. this particular play to a non-horseman like myself and, and most people that are, are, are listening is, is difficult to wrap your head around. I'm extrapolating from the experiences of really talented, experienced medieval and Renaissance uh, practitioners of what we do with swords and armor and spears and stuff. Um, and I have great respect for their skills and for the amount of effort they've put into it over the years. They know the subtleties of riding much, much better than any of us can possibly imagine. So when they give a piece of advice about something like, look, look, you turn and look you in the eye, go, oh, no, no, no. You got to have both feet set, really in the, really in the stirrups to stand in that saddle. And that's how they put it to stand in that saddle. Mm -hmm. It's not to ride in that saddle or to sit that saddle. It's to stand in that saddle. And also, um, another sort of tangent, but uh, Charney's questions um, in mid-14th century about chivalry, about fighting in tournaments and wars and whatnot, he often says, you know, when two men are, are riding at each other and they stand in the saddle, one, you know, one is difficult to unhorse, but one that's not standing, but is seated, is more easily unhorsed type of thing. Um, there may be something in Ben Cavalier about it too, but I haven't read that often enough compared to Sharni's questions. So I can't say. I mean, once we get into Vadi, I'm going to get lost pretty quick. There's a lot of stuff I haven't read yet. Well, hopefully, uh, hardly any of us have read Vadi when we go to Vadi. So we'll all be in good company, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It's been years since I read through the Porzoi uh, Melee one. I've got a copy of it, but I do not have a copy of. Uh, Guy Windsor, so please send me one. Yep, I'll send to him on Facebook, uh, Cal. If you, um, Thank you I'll try to remember, but if I don't, you send me a message and I'll throw it over. Okay, yep. great. Yep. Um, all right, 44VD, uh, the next um, countermaster here. Uh, Alex, would you like to read this one for us? This is the eighth play which counters all of the plays before this, especially those of Mounted Sword and their masters in Kotalunga. When the masters or students are in this guard, I attack them with a thrust or another blow, and they will try to parry these attacks. So upon the parry, I quickly turn my sword and strike them in the face with the pommel. Then I pass with a quick cover and strike back at the back of uh, the head of the reverse, so Tondo. Thank you very much, sir. All righty. So, um, shocker. Right here, we have a play like this. It's working on the simple principles that we already know from the sword, which is uh, go to the other side. Right. When your points offline, use the other part. And the spear, and the and the axe, etc. Right. We've seen this tons of times. This is familiar to us now. 
the only weapon this doesn't happen with is a dagger. Yeah. Yeah. And in even then with the dagger occasionally you can pull off some things like attacking Mendrito oh, yeah. and then and then oh, sure. turning to Reverso, you know, which but is it, something it, of an, an analogy, but it's it's never explicit. No, 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 no. Of course not. No. It's explicit yeah. in all the other weapons. Yeah. Um yeah. So Again, uh, basically universal counter, not much to add or elaborate on other than what we already know. Um, as a sort of a reprise, uh, the challenge as the agent, um, it's the same challenge with the patient too, but particularly with the agent because they need to stay ahead in tempo when they're attacking. The agent needs to act proportionally in order to maintain their tempo advantage. So when, when you're coming around like this as the agent the person who's leading you have to come around or the challenge that you're being offered is to come around in as quickly as possible which means you need to move as little as possible and as subtly as possible which equates to, to less time of course right um, and all of that can be summed up as saying move in proportion to the defense that's offered to you. So if they slam your sword out of the way, they're giving you lots of energy and time for your sword to come around. If they engage you very subtly, then you have to respond very subtly in direct proportion to what they're giving you. And that's always the, the big challenge for the agent. And when with mounted combat, we have the additional problem of having the time compressed because the, the horses are typically not completely stationary, but they're moving. Uh, so that makes it even more important to get it right on the first try. Very complex. Can you get back to the text real quick? Mm -hmm. take a <laughs> when the masses of students are in this guard, I attack them with a thrust or another blow. Doesn't matter. When they parry, I quickly turn my sword around and strike them in the face with the pommel. And then, and then once that's done, as he's, he's riding away. You can still have a good. Uh, you can still possibly strike the back of the head of the reversal tondo. I don't know why this this always comes to my mind when I read this, but I just happened to rewatch the old uh, Disney Three Musketeers with uh, Charlie Sheen as one of the musketeers and uh, what's his name, um, something Quaid, not Dennis Quaid, but his brother is one of the Randy other musketeers. Yeah, Randy Quaid is one of the musketeers and uh, that was and uh, uh, what's his face, um, uh, Tim Sutherland. Yeah, keep it. That, that's it. And what's the cardinal's name? Oh God, um, t Tim uh, Tim Curry. Tim, Tim Curry, Curry is the cardinal. Yeah, yeah. He's this comically evil cardinal. But anyway, he uh, there's he, he, did he, he did a great job. He did a great job. He made that movie watchable. Yeah, yeah. He he looked the part uh, with the with the mustache and the the pointy the, the pointy uh, go team whatever. Yeah. But there's one play and uh, there's one play in the movie where they they ride past each other these two horsemen and they have like rapiers or whatever but um the one guy i think it's a the the main villain the, the guy this this guy with black cloak with a black hat or whatever he does this mezzano to the other person to the to the hero to d'artagnan and there it's at the mezzano when they basically pass each other and i always remember that play because it looks like they're past each other and then he does this mezzano to him and he hits him and he knocks him off his horse so that's a long, long yeah. story, but it's an it's, it's an thing. interesting thing, right? We in the we that played in the SCA for a long time, we call that a rap shot. Mm. Um, when you rap, um, it, it's not so bad with a sword; you get hit in the back of the head. A lot of people, including Brian, argued against it being ineffective against the helmet. Well, that's true, but the helmet only goes so far. Uh, most people throw it to the back of the helmet because they're not trying to murder the person that they're they're playing with in game. But the reality is, is you throw it to the spine, the, the second or third vertebrae, just below where a helmet would be, unless it had a long tail or avid tail or something on it. Um, when I used to do that blow with, with what's a mace that's literally a big padded thing, not like a Q-tip pad, but mine was actually a lot heavier. But uh, when you do that to somebody, you can literally talk, knock them off their feet. 
hitting someone like that on horseback, they're going to fall down over the over the horse's neck. There's no two ways about it, especially yeah. if they have no helmet. Yeah, no the helmet rat, with sharps. Yeah. Done with a false edge. The, mm. Done with a false edge uh, with your thumb, mm -hmm. and I can apply it from five different angles, just like forward. It's 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 a very wicked thing. Whether it's a historical uh, blow with a mace, I don't know, because there's no sort of context for it. But it's certainly um, commented enough in uh, many of the mm, jests, the, the heroic stories of the French Norman period, that, you know, being struck in the back of the head uh, by someone riding beside you was, was one of the worst things, and that's why it was so important to have your squire nearby or to have a, you know, a sword brother nearby so that someone couldn't sneak up behind you and lay one on the back of your head. Um, <clears throat> in a much later period, there's a uh, a blow to the leg, more more 16th century, but uh, a blow to the back of the leg by a particular fellow named uh, uh, Le Comte de Jarnac, and, and they call it Le Comte de Jarnac. But basically what it was was a, a, a false edge cut to the back of the knee, above the knee, so you're cutting the uh, back of the it's not the quads. I can't remember what's up there, but basically, you're not cutting the calf, but you're cutting the the the, the two uh, connecting ligaments behind above the knee. And the coup de jarnac was something that this guy was well known for, and it comes up in one of the major fencing manuals of the period. Um, so it was the sort of thing that people had to be aware of. If you let someone get too close to you. You can protect the front of your leg with footwork and whatnot, but you can't protect the back of your leg with footwork because uh, uh, re, uh, pulling your leg back is the, the normal sort of thing, and that puts your leg into the weight of the blow. So what's relatively medium to light blow becomes much harder because you're trying to step back or you're trying to slip your leg back. Hmm. Anyways, point being, hmm. being cut in the back of the leg, bad plan. Yeah. All right, moving right along. The counter contrary. 45 RA. Oh, sorry, I said a quick question oh. about that last one. Yes, absolutely, Grant. No um, problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're shown engaging on the left side. Mm -hmm. Does this only work on the left side? Because a lot of the other plays that we've seen are on the right side, and this says it's a counter to all previous plays. That's true. I would say no, but that does bring up an interesting point, though. And this, I'm going to offer this as a speculation. I'm not going to get into it uh, too much right now, but there isn't an obvious demarcation in the mounted section between plays and actions on one side versus plays and actions on the other. Right now, obviously they're. The plays are sided, most of them, by nature. But Fiore hasn't explicitly said, okay, so here are all the plays on the right side, and here are all the plays on the left side, right? The, the, the sides seem to kind of switch a bit, right? Or they, they vary depending on the context of the defense he's showing or whatever, or at least they seem, <clears throat> they seem to. So they, They're very, they're, if I can interrupt, yeah. they're very, very dependent on the length of the weapons. Sure. The... the yeah. The, uh, when when the weapons are of equal length, they tend to pass on the same side unless they have a defensive mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, piece of equipment uh, like a shield, mm -hmm. where you saw that in the in the land stuff. Uh, they pass they pass on a particular side when they have a shield, and they pass on a different side when they don't have a shield, or it's not as critical when they don't have a shield. Mm -hmm. And when you get into the the sword on sword stuff, it's either way, but it tends to be right on right. Mm -hmm. um, and where it's left on left, where you this last play that we just saw, uh, I can see that stuff working just as well from either side. Exactly. <laughs> I can uh, see I it. Whether I've done it, no. Yeah. But. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's a long, a long way of saying exactly what what Kel said. This the sword seems to be shown on both sides. There isn't an obvious sidedness to sword on sword, and he's showing this on the left side. Um, we've seen other things work on the right side. Um, we already know, we already have precedent for pummel strikes on the left side from the sword and two hands. So theoretically, it should be more or less equivalent, um, but it would, of course, benefit from testing. Thank you. 
All right, that's a great question. Okay, and uh, back, uh, oh, nope, that's not the one. Uh, this one. Back on the opposite side, 45RA. Uh, Andrew, would you like to read this one for us? Please and thank you. Okay. I am the ninth play, the counter to the counter that we just saw. As the opponent turns his sword, I place my handle as depicted, and the pommel will not strike me. If I lift my sword and turn my sword to the reverso side, the opponent could lose his sword. If this does not work, or if I do not perform this action, I can strike the opponent's face with a reverso, or his head with my pommel, since the turn of my sword will be very quick. This ends the play of mounted sword against sword. If you know my any more, please do give me a good measure of your wisdom. <laughs> Every time I read this, I read it. I read it differently. Sometimes I read it as like, "If you know any more, wink, wink." No, you don't. Shut up. Or and, and other times I read it, I'm like, "If you know any more, uh, can you uh, yeah, let me know what they are?" And, and, and Vadi says something similar. <laughs> I hear uh, I hear all those wife Judy's voice saying that. Oh really? Because she's always, she's from uh, she's from Staten Island, right? Uh -huh. And she's got this thing about you know you show her something really cool or tell her about something really cool. She goes, yeah, what else you got? Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I hear here. What uh, else you got? Uh, how to deflate someone <laughs> in a single sentence? Oh um, shit! So, yeah. so from, this is either uh, you can either disarm him or hit him in the face with your pommel that's that's the options here yeah so let's or your, let's or take your a leg. there are all kinds of things are available if you don't if yeah. you don't disarm him then you can either hit him with your pommel or a stroke of the sword because it's really easy to turn your wrist and present either part of the sword a sword in one hand is very fluid mm -hmm. um, your your wrist has to be subtle like a snake there's no two ways about it. And in this particular case, turning the pommel against his can allow you so many different things. Um, like in the stretto play with the sword in two hands, when you take his pommel down, you actually hit him in the face all at the same time. I mean, there's, a, there's a play where you enter from the left, from the reverso, and uh, you touch his wrist with your hand so you get a check on it. And then you put your your grip against his blade and drive it down. Well, turning the sword, Mezza Volta, in that way, takes the pommel down and brings your blade in line. And you're already behind his sword and hand, therefore you hit him in the face with the blade. In this case, if you set, if you set him aside with your pommel, you can hit him in with the pommel. If you pull him down with the pommel, then you hit him with the blade. Either way, it's a win. Mm -hmm. And There's the, three options in this play. The more, yeah, continue. Yeah, and the more final options, like the the responding with cuts, etc., that um, happens when the agent has lost their tempo advantage in Largo. Um, this is the case uh, on foot as well. Uh, if you have a combo that you're throwing, and you know you you you're planning on going one, two, three, and out, for example, right? If you lose your tempo advantage after your first blow and you still act like you have it, then you, what you're doing is you're presenting threats that the opponent is under no obligation to cover because they're now the first actor, right? They're now leading. And so that, that allows them to, to do some pretty spectacular cuts and counters to you, which you're not going to be defending because you're trying to do the thing you wanted to do. But you didn't realize you lost the um, you lost the tempo. So um, keeping the tempo, like I said before, with this a follow on is critical. And if you lose it and do it anyway, without trying to cover yourself, then you you give your counter contrary opponent uh, big opportunities for plays like this. <clears throat> lose your initiative, not yeah. your tempo. Yeah. Well, I I use them interchangeably, but anyway. Okay. Um, yeah. So, again, important fencing lessons uh, on horseback, um, as on foot. 
So how many of these sword on sword actions can then be translated directly to unmounted unmounted sword in one hand and unmounted long sword in two hands? That's a good question. Well, um, uh, I would say at least half of the Emma curriculum of sword in one hand, which we've now, mm, we, we concentrated on it for a long time. The people in Guelph under Murph's control, or, or, or tutelage, I should say, not control, but uh, he wasn't as keen on the plan. He wanted it as an auxiliary, whereas Brian decided we were going to use it as a gateway to get new people in. And what we found was after about two years, our, our scholar candidate, candidates did not use a longsword. They could only sword, fight with sword in one hand. Uh, so we went back with Merce clan, and now we, we use the uh, <clears throat> sword in one hand as an auxiliary. Almost half of the sword in one hand plays come from the equestrian section. So to say that you study Fury's sword without studying this takes about maybe a fifth of all of the sword plays out of your curriculum. So there's an awful lot here that is dependent on walking past. None of this is static. Your, your, your elephant, per se, uh, has strength, but it's moving. Uh, there's a lot more celeritas involved on, on horse than, a, than the elephant. Uh, and of course, prudentia is really high, but it's, it's, it's really not a case of equally translating some of these actions to static positions and footwork where you make contact and pull back, like say in armored combat, uh, you can make contact and be static and, and get your plays to happen and have different opportunities. If you continue to move forward, you can press yourself to the point of uselessness where you have no choice but to grapple, therefore making your sword a useless implement and wasting all of its potentials. If you try to force the play by using your weight or your uh, initiative to pull back and therefore drag your opponent off balance, you have a, a very poor presumption that you're stronger or faster than they are. You may not be, and you may be horribly surprised. So on horseback, we've got one convention. The horses never back up. They rarely stand anything close to still. At best, they move slowly past each other. The convention on mm -hmm. foot is you don't often pass each other. You mostly pass each other with turns to trip each other up. So whether <clears throat> a sword in one hand can be directly translated to foot combat or for that matter, the sword with two hand isn't a fair question. It is a question of expanding your total horizon. How much, how much uh, square mileage can you cover with your skills in all of these different situations. And this gives you a whole set of tools that work in particular circumstances where you never have those circumstances, say on foot in armor with a sword in two hands. There are still common threads like this pommel strike. Yeah. Um, this can be done just as easily with sword in armor. If you had sure. the sword in two hands on the horse's back and you hooked his pommel, well, it may be a bit slower, but you'd still really, really rank this guy off of his horse. Like it'd be wrenching to him. Mm -hmm. But um, it's not necessary because you've got the inertia of the horses. And it's something that it's really hard to wrap around most people's heads that, that haven't done much riding. Um, you got at least a thousand pounds of animal on top of moving. So that's added to your own inertia. And for those of us that are, you know, well over 200 pounds, like you and I, Andrew, or, um, I'm sorry, BD, um, this is, this is a significant amount of inertia to have an advantage or disadvantage over misusing. It gives you real big problems, but using it in a timely manner gives you strengths that you could not possibly have with a simple one-arm action. So does this help us per se? Yes, it all fits together. It's inter interwoven. But is it specifically going to help us with foot combat? No, no, it's not. It's just more layers to add.
it's a bigger onion with more layers. Does that help at all? I like that phrasing, additional tools and more layers. Yeah. And talking about the mounted section, it sounds like it would be specifically useful for people that like to push in. Yes, and also if you're if you're dealing with um, open field play, which we we almost never do at Emma, but I have enormous amount of experience with fighting many many people at a time. Um, this is critical stuff in a melee, really critical, where people are always moving around you, or at best you're facing a line of people who are going to strike you from different angles. Um, but mostly, you know, maneuvering around. To fight somebody when there are two or three other groups or singles or doubles or triples of people fighting each other all around you who could suddenly break off and attack you from the flank you got to get stuff done you can't fool around and get you know like wait for the pennant to be brought brought to you by the herald after you won you got to get the stuff over with and get on to the next thing um, and that's something that's really hard for us to teach at Emma because we fight one on one. Here in Guam, I'm not... there are some times where we have um, somebody waiting in the wings. If you don't defeat, <laughs> buddy, I'll defeat. tell you. Let me let me put it to you bluntly. The last ten years of my twenty three years in the SCA, I spent fighting two and three people at a time almost all the time. So fighting one on one for me is is actually very relaxing. Um, so the idea that this stuff can be simulated by having someone come at you immediately afterwards has no bearing whatsoever on having to deal with two or three people at a time and keeping track of other people around you on the field the closest i could come is my experience with some uh tankers in the canadian armed forces where the guy was explaining this, this particular captain uh, was explaining to me what it was like for those uh, 30 seconds that they expected to survive in combat where there's there's commands coming to you other tanks are talking to you your gunners trying to, to, to find out where you want to lay the gun on the driver wants to know whether he should continue what he's doing and you have to command all of this stuff all at once and then decide when to kick kick the pedal to, to fire the gun because it's sort of at, in, in a leopard one it's a it's a, a kick pedal um, you, know, you just kind of push it with your toe, your right toe, and off it goes. But um, this thing is, it, it, it's a similar sort of concept where there's so much stuff going on at the same time. You cannot give your 100% uh, concentration to the one person you're fighting. You have to give like, you know, 80, 90% at least, but you still have to be cognizant of what's going on around you comrades are doing and this is where the training and uh, of the familia comes in where you ride with these people you go you ride the 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 boundaries of the land together in small groups you go hunting together you have mock battles together occasionally someone in you know the neighboring county will arrange a party and there'll be the you know a joust and a feast and and some mock battles and stuff because it gives you an opportunity to play with the people that are nearest to your own familia but all of this stuff is really really important for what we call in modern day terms unit cohesion so your individual uh, prowess and purpose as a soldier is one thing but you're also part of a unit uh, it, it's, it's a very complex thing to, to wrap your head around in modern day society. But uh, if you've watched enough mafia movies about the concept of the consigliere, the, the advisor, and the capos who are in charge, and don't question me, you haven't earned it, and you know all of this kind of stuff, there's an awful lot of similarities that can be drawn to Italian society of this point in time. And in fact, even earlier, um, the first major uh, action, what we would call the Cosa Nostra today, was actually in Sicily in the 13th century, where literally the entire island of Sicily rose up against their French um, masters who had, who had taken over the island. They rose up in one night and killed all the major players and took control of the island simply because 
people knew how to keep their mouths shut and work together. That is a, an incredible thing for a medieval society to accomplish. Um, stuff like this you can only get by reading history and learning about the culture of a different time. It wasn't just that these were people that lived before us. The, it was a different world. And to look at um, how can we make this play work on foot when it's a horse play is missing the point of how do we make fighting work in different situations with different assets and different liabilities. This is why Fiori is such a wonderful system to uh, learn because it's a holistic approach from the ground up that shows us the strengths and the, and the importances in combat, the things that you had to have, the virtues, the strengths to be able to do these sorts of things. Compare that to uh, the later Meyer tradition in Germany when it was about school fencing between uh, guildsmen, basically people that had a little bit of leisure time, a little bit extra money that were willing to go play at sports. Um, they're much more like we are than we will ever be like medieval noblemen. That's all I can say about that. Um, we are approaching the end of our uh, evening, uh, everyone, which will make next week our final session for Fiori, and then the following week we'll begin Vadi. But I wanted to look at one quick play from the Morgan before we finish. Um, so I'm going to read it here. This is Folio 6RB in the uh, Morgan. For those of you who don't know, the Morgan is in roughly reverse order to the Getty, so the mounted section is actually first. But in any case, um, this uh, this piece of text is really, uh, really important. And we missed it in the scholar section, which is unfortunate. So um, it reads, these two masters here are crossed at the full of the sword. And that which one can do, the other can do also. That is, he can do all the plays of the sword with this crossing. But the crossing is of three categories. That is, from the full of the sword to the tip of the sword. And whoever is crossed at the full of the sword can withstand a little. Whoever is crossed at the middle of the sword can withstand less. And whoever is crossed at the tip of the sword can withstand nothing at all. So the sword, as such, has three, master, uh, three matters. That is, a little, less, and nothing. It's interesting that he's got it here in the equestrian section because this is in the uh, sword and two hands section we're at the at the beginning of, of the section where he starts talking about the sword in uh, in the getty it's, in the getty yeah. actually yeah. so uh um not to quibble but this caught this category about um this the sword withstanding on the engagement i believe is unique uh no. to the uh no to, to the morgan no. um but we can we it's can the getting. we can call me a liar. Let's, uh, let's confirm. No, I'm not that. calling you a liar. I'm just saying. No, 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 no. But it's, I, it's really it. No, let's no, confirm it's that. It's really good to observe mm. that it is. No, I'm going to say it's be, before he describes the first play of the sword in two hands. Uh, before the first play, you mean in yeah, the preface well, okay. here? Yeah, in the preface. Okay. Uh, um, where 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 he mm -hmm. describes this as. Um, looking to uh, uh, when he starts the first play and he talks about crossing at the tips mm -hmm. in Largo yeah. in Largo okay. yeah okay. first play in Largo mm -hmm. yeah. where he's, he talks about crossing at the tips it's almost like, it's almost word for word there um well, we'll have to we'll, 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 have, read it. we'll have to um, I'll look at this further of course it very it may very well but be it, it's interesting um, that he says it in yeah the equestrian section in the Morgan, and he saves it to the uh, sword and two hands on foot in the uh, in the Getty, because the Getty is uh, a presentation of, of uh, building on a foundation, whereas the Morgan is a presentation based on the typical progression of a passage in arms. Yes, indeed, indeed, and uh, and and again, it's an example. 
just to kind of cap off the night. It's an example of how critical information in Fiore is often sprinkled throughout the book. Uh, and it's not the case that everything you need to know about Abrazari is in the Abrazari section and sword is in the sword section, etc., etc. This yeah. is a really critical piece of um, theoretical commentary, I would, as I read it course just my view as always um but this is a critical piece of theoretical commentary about the nature of engagements with the sword yeah. and of course it doesn't even necessarily apply to the sword right pole axes spears have engagement points as well right and depending on the geometry of the weapon where you're at some can you know some engagements can withstand a little yeah. some a little it, less it, it, and it, even it, it some nothing at it all. doesn't apply to the pole ox. it doesn't and to the sword and so. spear yes um, but sword yeah, one hand, sword in two hands. Yeah. No, when you go when you go back and read the uh, the the beginning of the first uh, the first plays of a sword in two hand, this text, not word for word, but all uh, concept for concept, is right there uh, as it goes about uh, where you turn. You, you know, if you're if you meet the tips, you you. If you win the crossing, you continue the same side. If you if you lose the crossing, you turn to the other side and cut down. Um, and he says because the sword can you know withstand. Just go back and read it. It's, it's gotcha. there in both. I'll have to have a look at it again. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Anybody have any uh, last comments or questions before we uh, end this uh, session? Well, newfound uh, respect for mounted plays. What's yes, that? indeed. Mm. Oh, the mounted plays are awesome because um, from teaching them to other people, the best simulation I could create, and you know, on a floor space in a in a big room, is walking briskly past each other, and um, it's something that I I didn't come up with by myself. It was suggested to me by someone who, you know, is more versed in this sort of uh, combat on horseback and he said well you know like we can practice this stuff without the horses we just have to walk past each other and it, it you know kind of was one of those moments of uh, um, because a lot of people that joust don't start on horseback they do stuff on horseback like tilting at rings and things like that or and then the quintain eventually everybody likes the quintain but apparently jousting at rings is way better for your horsemanship and your and, you know your ability to manage the spear uh the quintain teaches you how to not get hit when you've already hit something but the the, the person that pointed this out to me i don't, don't even remember oh i know who it was rod walker from australia um you know, we're having breakfast at, the, at this event in, in London in 2003, and he had just had his shoulder dislocated by a strike uh, the night before. So, you know, we're sitting there, he and his wife and, and Dave Savat and Brian and I are all, you know, robbing breakfast together type of thing. And we were talking about this stuff about, because, you know, back then we were still developing our curriculum. Um, and, and he points out that he says, yeah, well, you know, this is what my squires do. I give them the I give them the the shield and I give them the sword, uh, spear and they just run at each other. <laughs> I went what? He says yeah they run at each other. I have them go out and run. You know I said, he said you know like if they don't get it then I have them walk past each other until they get it and then they run at each other. If they can't get it when they run at each other they're not going to do it on horseback. And I went oh that makes perfect sense. And and Rod looked at me like okay you don't ride much do you? You know. It was pretty cool. Rod Walker's a super human being, really cool guy, really, really easy going fellow. I don't think he jousts anymore. Though. I think he had to give it up because uh, his body just couldn't take it anymore. This is like 15 years ago. Uh, for anyone he's a who's coal... there, he's go. a coal miner. He's a coal miner, and his body couldn't take jousting. Think about it. Like, coal mining's hard work. Look up Rod Walker. Super guy. Actually, fantastic guy. Uh, if any of you uh, have never heard of the uh, the uh, King of the Saracens festival in Arezzo, Italy, it's one of the cool. it's one of the I'm showing it on, on my video right now, Kel. Uh, yeah. It's one of the many interesting cultural martial games that um, are remnants of 
uh, medieval festivals and things in towns in Italy. And in this particular uh, challenge, each city quarter or a bunch of teams in the city have riders. And as you see, they're riding on a, on a quintain and they're trying to hit a, hit a target. And the, the nub of the lance is chalked with charcoal and the target is, uh, is white and they have target paper and there's a mace on it and whatever. And then the target's scored and things like that. But um, it's very fun and very interesting. And uh, one of the interesting things that you'll see, and maybe, uh, Bruce, you might be able to comment on this, but uh, one of the the crazy things about this particular skill is that when the when these riders go by, the horse is galloping at a full gallop, but basically from the waist up, they are stone cold still. And that lance is just, it look, the lance looks like it's frozen in time. Uh, 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 basically when they, when they run and it's really, it's just really cool to see them, uh, to see them go. And uh, if you look at how they're ho sitting in the saddle, that looks to me like they're pretty straight. Um, but, uh, we'll watch one more, one more. There we go. That's the red team. Look at that. That's crazy. Uh, they've got their, they got their legs. Back. They're not, they're not yeah. sitting. What's interesting though, is because these guys are riding in a quintain, they're actually, uh, targeting the particular parts of the shield of the quintain for more points mm -hmm. much like you target you know various things on a dartboard and these guys are good i mean yeah. they're steady as a rock because riding on a full tilt like that even on a, a moderately sized horse like they're riding um, it, 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 there's a lot of movement involved mm -hmm. you know like john woods for example has spent an awful lot of time uh riding one of his uh, smaller horses uh, doing this kind of stuff i think he gave it up a while ago because he's more interested in other things now but he he spent an awful lot of time riding that one horse doing this stuff and, and apparently the horse really liked it um uh, what's his name uh north uh, dale gino mm -hmm. had, a, had a horse that really enjoyed doing this it was f for that horse it was it was playtime it was like a dog with a ball running at the quintain uh, running at the rings or any of that kind of stuff was all about being in tune with dale you know like it was the horse loved dale of course and he loved the horse so the two of them were a welded unit and when they rode around doing this stuff it was like Taking your dog, not taking your dog for a walk, but taking your dog for a workout, you know, herding sheep or something like that. I, the only way I can describe the way Dale described it to me was there was there's so much uh, empathy between the two of them to get the job done as best as possible. The horse knew his job, the rider knew his job, and and doing them together was great fun. And when things worked out the joy that the rider felt went through the horse. The horse could feel it as well. Mm. You could feel the horse literally joyful because of the, the pleasure emanating from the rider. Uh, they're very empathetic uh, creatures. And it's, it's, it's just a, a beautiful thing that not enough of us will mm. ever have the opportunity to enjoy. I've certainly been around horses more than a little in my life but never, never even close to enough. I will, uh, until I own horses of my own, I will never have that same feeling. So it's uh, something as, that I wish I had. As to your question about him, uh, his mm -hmm. upper torso, mm -hmm. uh, which one rides sufficiently long enough, you will, uh, it's almost as if the torso is detached from your hips. The mm. hips are on the horse, and the horse is moving around, and you learn to keep your torso steady, mm. relaxed, so that the it, the upper body... The closest thing I can compare it to is if anybody's ever gone skiing, and you're skiing mm. over moguls and you're going down, yeah. your legs are going up and down, but your upper body is, is steady. Mm. And in fact, riding horse is very much like skiing. If you're going down a, down a hill, and your legs and so on are going all over the the mount the moguls and hills and bouncing and springing and everything else, and your upper body is remaining uh, steady, mm -hmm. and balanced. 
And that's it's, it's interesting. Uh, that's an interesting comparison, Bruce. Uh, in in my mind, what I've seen it more closely related to is motocross riding, where the the rider is dead stable. Their head seems to hardly move at all. The shoulders and arms never seem to really change, but the lower part of their body is welded to the beast, to the machine. The machine gets pushed through its paces over difficult ground. The upper body doesn't change a lot, but everything that's happening below is related to how the machine is angled or pitched or, or whatever. For example, you know, making hard turns uh, where the body gets really low and the knee and the foot are basically uh, grazing the ground. But the upper body, you never see their heads move. It's just mm -hmm. like it's a, like a statue. It's, no, 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 I'm just saying it's yes, that's it's, very it's important. an interesting thing. Yeah, to see. it is. It is exactly that. Because if the rider, if the upper torso is moving around, it's the same effect as if you were in armor, as you were saying before, because mm, it throws yeah. the entire weight off. Yes, yes, mm. yes. Yeah, good, good analogy. Beautiful. Excellent. Mm. I'm really grateful for your experience and these conversations, Bruce. Thank you so much for coming out. Uh, another great sport, uh, 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 horse sport in Italy to look at is the Palio in Siena. That's a fantastic yeah. one. It usually inv in involves a whole bunch of uh, people brawling at the end every year. So it's also very fun. There's, there's nothing better than watching Italians in medieval costume uh, brawling because they're mad at what's happening at a town a town uh, event it almost brings you back almost oh, brings you back but anyway it's nothing, nothing compared, um, to those, uh, <laughs> compared to those football games they have with fist fights um you know, and, oh uh calcio storico oh, i never miss one they're great oh man they're oh, they're man. great anyways anyways good session tonight folks thanks very much for coming out we will come uh, to tonight. our last session next week thank you very much last few hours session next week thank you very much for coming and we'll see you uh see you next week yep awesome Thanks a lot, Aaron. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. <laughs>